We just listened to the first two episodes of a new podcast, and we want to tell you all about it. The show is called Nobody Should Believe Me, and it's a groundbreaking investigation into Munchausen by proxy. Anyone who listens to Murder Sheet knows we really appreciate a deep dive into a subject. Well, no one has ever done anything of this depth and breadth on the topic before. You will be enthralled by the stories it tells, but even more importantly, you will learn a great deal about how to keep kids in your community safe from harm. But what makes this show different is that the host of the podcast, novelist Andrea Dunlop, has a uniquely personal connection to this subject. Someone close to her was investigated for Munchausen by proxy a while ago. So to her, this is not just something that happens to other people. Her personal story really gives this show an emotional punch. It also means she really makes an effort to get at the humanity of all of the people involved, all the victims and survivors. This isn't a podcast that focuses on the gruesome details. It has heart. Andrea really uses her storytelling skills to help us get to know the wide variety of people whose lives have been affected by Munchausen by proxy. New episodes drop every Thursday. Listen and subscribe to Nobody Should Believe Me on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts. Content warning. This episode contains discussion of murder. This is the first episode of the second iteration of You Never Can Forget, a miniseries made up of our ongoing coverage of the Burger Chef murders. I first got seriously involved in the Burger Chef case thanks in large part to the robust online community that has grown around the case. People interested in sharing their research or discussing the ins and outs of the case with friends and families of the victims can join two Facebook groups, Justice for the Speedway Burger Chef Murders and the official Speedway Burger Chef Murders Unsolved Discussion Group. This community is such an important part of the case that we decided to talk with a representative of it. Hank, which is not his real name, is an active participant in the groups, and we have been impressed with the quality of his research and his insights. We reached out to him to have a talk about some of the theories and rumors that have circulated around this case since the night in November 1978, when Ruth Shelton, Danny Davis, Mark Flemons, and Jane Freed were kidnapped from the Speedway Burger Chef and murdered in the woods of Johnson County, Indiana. We thought that inviting a sharp commenter to cover the highlights of the case would be a good way to kick off this second series. If you are super familiar with this story, know that we won't be covering much new ground this week, but we believe you still might get something out of the conversation. If you aren't familiar with the Burger Chef case, welcome And rest assured, we will be recommending past episodes of the show to catch you up to speed. We will be covering some fresh material next week. My name is Anya Kane. And I'm Kevin Greenlee. And this is The Murder Sheet, a weekly true crime podcast. We are continuing the multi-part look into the Burger Chef murders we began last year. Each week, as part of our mini-series, You Never Can Forget, we will be presenting you with new information and context on what happened. We don't just rely on what we've been told or what we've read. We have worked this case ourselves. We decided to do this podcast so we can tell you what we've learned and even clear up a few misconceptions. We're the murder sheet, and this is You Never Can Forget, The Retrospect.
so, okay, so I guess to start off with, um, tell us a bit how you initially got into the Burger Chef case. When I was a kid growing up, we, you know, we lived in the area less than two miles away. My, my next door neighbor at the time that lived next door to my parents, his mom was from um, Mooresville area. And, you know, we would take her, her parents were still alive living over there at the time. Uh, you know, so we would go over there and they'd go hang out, whatever. We used to actually go over there in the wintertime when it used to snow enough, we'd ride snowmobiles around the cornfield and stuff behind their house. So one day, I think we were heading over to that area and this was probably mid nineties, maybe 94, 95, something like that. And we were driving pet. We were on, we were on stones crossing going past timber Heights, which at that time was still pretty new neighborhood. Um, and she mentioned to us kids and, you know, there's three of us in the back of their, their custom van. She's like, Hey, that's the neighborhood where they found those, you know, where they found those kids that were killed, at, you know, from the burger chef. Um, and she told us this story about, you know, somebody that she knew thinks they saw them riding around in the van before it all happened. You know, there was kids looking out the back window with the windows fogged up and that always kind of stuck with me. Like that would be, you know, a horrible, a horrible thing to go through. And so that is initially how I kind of became aware of it. And then, you know, as you go through the years, you know, you hear things on the newspaper and or on the, on the news, you know, on the radio and on the TV, especially around anniversary times. And then um, kind of moving into my professional career, I became interested in it from, from that, from that aspect of it, like the, just the, all the ins and outs and, and what, have I learned, you know, through my, through what I do that can maybe help foster some discussion or, or um, maybe uncover something that might help somebody that's actually, you know, on the inside, that's actually officially working on this. So that's kind of been my, my, my interest with it, I, I would say. Absolutely. I mean, you've done some really amazing research on, on this case. And I guess, you know, in, in terms of, your own interest in true crime or other cases have you ever had that kind of level of you know drive to work on um other cases or is it really is it been primarily burger chef no it, it's it's primarily it's primarily burger chef just because of where it happened i mean you know and, and where i grew up just being so close and it really hits close to home even though it was you know before before my time but it's still so relatable because i'm i'm so familiar with so many of the places that are connected to this thing. I think it's important to remember too, that this affected more communities than just, you know, the Speedway area. There was, there was the area where, where, where I grew up as well. And it's kind of like that part of it doesn't get so much attention. And I'm sure it, I'm sure it affected a lot of people there. I mean, just, you know, to live, I, I can just imagine what it would, what it would feel like to live around there at, at that time and, and know that potentially there's somebody you know, roaming around out there that's going to, you know, kill, I mean, if they're going to kill four, four innocent people that are minding their own business, then what are they going to do? Are they going to do home invasions now? I mean, who knows? So that, that's one of those things that I think it kind of gets left out when, when people kind of discuss it, or maybe, you know, when it ends up in the media, stuff like that. Yeah. The such fixation on the restaurant itself. Right. Yeah, yeah. I found that too. And it's like the killing actually took place 20 miles to the South. Mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, you mentioned the, your, your sort of geographic links to the case, um, you know, but I think, I mean, I, I think we see sometimes with, with cases and, and true crime cases, people sort of like uh, gravitate towards certain ones and, and they're almost a community rises up around it. You know, sometimes it can be a very chaotic, uh, maybe a little toxic community, and sometimes it can be very supportive. And I, I, I'm always fascinated with the burger chef community. Um, you know, people who are on the Facebook groups, you know, I think there's a lot of real interest uh, that, you know, in the crime and, and people really seem to want to help and they want to kind of go come forward with what they know uh, and, and with their specialties. And that's sort of what you've done. That's what Kevin's done. That's what I've, I've tried to do. Right. Uh, you know, and, and people kind of want to come in and help. So I, I just, I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on that? And I guess like, do you have any other thoughts about what really draws people into, to this specific crime? Mm -hmm. As far as being able to help and stuff, I, I think this is one of the things that affects 
a lot of, of investigative, you know, law enforcement investigative type work today is what they call the CSI effect. And people they see these programs on TV, which a lot of them are very good. They're very entertaining, but they see all these things that, that happen as in terms of, you know, crime scene investigation, DNA, um, and they, they want to look at something like this through the lens of today, the lens of 2021 or whatever, you know, 2000, whatever. And I, I think one of the things I've tried to do, like when I post stuff about you know, DNA or this or that, it's important that, that people need to remember and stay, you know, kind of put themselves in that time frame. is, is that that stuff didn't exist. I mean, it existed, but we didn't, you know, as a human species, we didn't really know about it except for like at the highest levels of, of, you know, biological science. And people just, I think, assume, especially when they get on, get in these groups on like social media and whatnot, they just assume that that has always been a thing. And until I think the first, I think the first case where, where DNA was actually used was in the UK, I think in 87 or 88. And people don't realize that it's been, you know, that was a good 10 years after. And, and, that, and that's not even in the United States, right? So to have a, a stuff, you know, DNA used in, the, in, the, in a US court, I mean, they didn't even know until what, I, I can't think of a date right now. I, I looked it up once, but I forget w whether it would even stand up in, in, you know, in, our, in our judicial system. So I think that there's just a lot of assumptions made that, you know, law enforcement should have done this or they should have done that or, or whatever. And, and it's kind of one of the things I try to do is, is kind of point back to that. Uh, the reality that some of these technology, a lot of these technologies weren't a thing. Um, I'm not saying you wouldn't be able to find anybody at a law enforcement agency back then that knew what DNA was, but I think they would be pretty few and far between. You know, and that goes for a lot of things like the, the whole profiling stuff, you know, psychological profiling. You didn't really see a lot of that until well into the 80s, I think. So it, it just wasn't that big of a, a focal point back then. And it's kind of it's I think it's important to to look at it through the look at the case through the lens of what the technology was then, what the capabilities were and kind of bring people back that, you know, they want to. They want to blame law enforcement because, oh, well, they should have been able to solve this DNA, blah, blah, blah. They didn't even collect evidence in 1978 with DNA in mind. It was not a thing. You know, nowadays, we'll, if we collect a gun, for instance. We're supposed to call someone especially trained to do it because of touch DNA. So it doesn't get messed up. So it's done the proper way. That was not even a remote consideration back then. So, you know, you're lucky if you got a blood type. Um, so it's it just, it's a, it's a different world. And I think that is always an important part to have in, in a, in a discussion where people are talking about this, that, to remember, remember that. Yeah. Um, and as far as what draws people to it, I think, you know, for me, it's been, again, the proximity to where I grew up, where I live and just the, the fact that draws so many people to it is, you know, there's these four kids that are minding their own business and they get jacked from a restaurant at night for no apparent reason and despite all the work that's gone into this over the years no you know still nobody knows what happened and i think that i think that's a big draw for a lot of people and of course you know then there's those the surviving family members are like they've never had any closure and i, I can imagine what it would be like to be in their position and like what happened you know yeah, I, I always and, and try not to go all vigilante on somebody that you know. But then again, you don't know who to go vigilante on because you don't know who did it. So it, it's just that that un, that that question that that unresolved piece is really what what it is. Yeah, and I, I I always say that I think the heinousness of the crime and and you know like these are four kids basically working at a fast food restaurant. That's such a American experience. At least it used mm -hmm. to be. You know. Yeah. And, you know, it's like, I always say, it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a crime that cries to heaven for justice. Cause it's just like, why can't this be solved? Like this right. is a case that deserves to be solved. All cases do obviously, but yeah, for sure. But I, I think, you know, and especially I think of like all the, all the, um, 
another thing that, that always comes to mind is like all the potential that was wasted um, with those kids. I mean, you know, you, I know you guys mentioned in one episode that, you know, Ruth was into computers and, and I remember thinking to myself one time as I was listening to one of the podcasts, I was like, you know, she probably would have been a millionaire today because I mean, you know, the time frame you're looking at late seventies, that, that technology was just starting up. And I mean, you know, who knows? I mean, she could have been, you know, Bill Gates, um, or, or some, I mean, some, you know, you just don't know. Um, and I think that goes, to this, it's the same story, I think for all of them, you know, that, you know, they had talents and, um, there was just so much potential there that was just wasted for no reason at all. And it was just like, why? Yeah. There's all those, those details you find out from talking with people who knew them. And like, you know, the, the idea that Mark was like practicing karate moves, like, like shortly before this happened, like, like they're just kids. Like, you know, mm-hmm. I, I remember we were looking through uh, Danny's yearbook and he was like, in the Latin club, the classics club, and like both Kevin and I are obsessed with Roman stuff. So we were like, wow, yeah. like, we probably would have hung out with him. If yeah, you've been friends with him back then. Yeah, like you know? and it, it, yeah, you see that, you see that connection. And it's like, it, it's really cool that, you know, I mean, some of the stuff he was, he was interested in as far as you know, photography and um, he just seems like, I mean, just a, a really good, solid kid. I mean, all of them really yeah. from everything that I know. And it, it's just like, you know, why? there's a lot of theories on the case and, and what might have happened. So um, we were hoping maybe we could go through some of those with you and sort of got your, got your take on them, like, you know, discuss some of them. Um, yeah. You know. I, I, what about Alan Pruitt and his story about Tim Willoughby? What do you make of that? Pruitt, of course, was the man who says he stood outside the burger chef as the victims were being abducted. According to Pruitt's original statement, the perpetrators were Tim Willoughby and Jeff Reed, and the motive was drug-related. We discussed Pruitt's tale in depth in our episodes, The Creek and The Backbone. To me, a matter of fact, I'm looking at it right now on my computer desktop, Pruitt statement. It's right here. <laughs> it's been here for a while. It makes sense to some extent. I definitely wouldn't take it off the table. I just wish that um, Pruitt hadn't been you know, drinking as much as he was. <laughs> Cause we might know a little bit more, but I mean, it's understandable. You know, what, what are you going to do? You, you can't know when something that terrible is going to happen. So if you're out having some beer, what do you, you know, <laughs> it's just the circumstances of the night, I think. So that's kind of where I'm at with that one. And I think, I think if Tim was involved, I think he fled. And I think he's, if he is still around, he's, he's hiding somewhere. If he is still around and I would be interested to see, you know, maybe an age progressed um, picture of Tim. So something like that, I think if, if somebody was to try to locate Tim, if he is still around, you know, that would be, I think, a useful tool. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. We've always said that we really would love for Tim Willoughby's face to get flashed all mm-hmm. around because, I mean, when you think about it, either he is himself likely the victim of a horrible crime and was murdered himself and right. should be found, or he might have been involved with one or more cases so it's it's sort of like either way it's good (laughs) um i've often wondered since he didn't show up to serve that jail sentence if he still has a warrant so yeah uh the i think the eight thousand pound gorilla right in the case in terms of suspects is donald forrester donald forrester is the convicted rapist who confessed to being one of the burger chef killers in 1986. he then recanted his admission In 1989, he repeated his confession and then recanted it once more. We discussed the Forrester saga in our episodes, The Tank and The Confessions. I think probably most of what he concocted was stuff that he'd he'd read. Um, Also, the fact that there was no sexual component involved that we know of, you know, I would think that that would be something that would have made it out by now if it it had happened. so that that wasn't there. And then the the 80, the 89 interview he gave. The one thing that kind of hangs me up that I think and, and this may just go back to his knowledge of the area. But when he described the route that they took. Um, from 465, uh, I know there, there's been some. 
it, it even seemed like the, the investigators at the time maybe didn't understand what he was saying or, or put two and two together. It took me a little bit to do it too, but to me, it sounded like he was describing that they did in fact get off the interstate at uh, 31 and then went south to Thompson. And anybody that knows the area knows if you make a right there, um, that'll take you over State Road 135. And I think that is the route that he described them taking. And I, I don't think that anybody really, at least to this point on a podcast, has put that together. I think it was, it, you know, based on his story was, okay, yeah, we made a right on Thompson Road. And then I guess maybe in his mind, he equated Thompson Road with State Road 135 all the way down to Stones Crossing. So that to me sounded like what he was trying to describe. And it was a lot. I mean, it was only once I, I can't speak to Marion County, but I know I remember in 89, they were just widening uh, State Road 135 in, in, in Greenwood. It had been previously before that. It had been two lanes and there was a lot less there back then. So I, I can see that as him describing a conceivable route. Um, but that said, I, I still don't think I, I think he just made too many. He made too many errors. Uh, in what he said, like, you know, the location of the stabbing and shooting people in the face and, and all that. And uh, that's a lot of that's been been like contradicted. So I don't I don't think he was there. I don't think he was involved. Uh, could he have found out about it from somebody that was maybe could he have just read things in the paper and, you know, putting two and two together with with as much as he did know about the area that it's possible. I think that's that's probably to me that's probably for him is is more likely than than the fact that you know, maybe he was there that night. I don't I don't I don't think it's very likely. And and I think to me something people don't necessarily realize about Forrester is he did sort of in his own mind have a reason to lie given mm-hmm. sort of trying to negotiate, you know, bring me to Marion jail, I don't want to be at Michigan state. And of course to people who are not in jail or you know that that doesn't sound like a real reason but in right. his mind it was. Yeah. And he was severely mentally ill. That's not an excuse mm-hmm. for his actions. He was a violent piece of work, but he was, he was saying things like he thought the warden was putting stuff in his brain. And so he was, you know, he was trying to, he was really trying to get out of there. And I, and I can definitely see, I mean, I can definitely see just putting yourself, just getting in a, in a, getting into a situation like that where you're not, you, you know, you, you basically have no hope of release. Um, you're, you, it's probably going to, you know, maybe he was a little bit predisposed to a mental health issue like that. And that was the thing that, that triggered it, that set him off. Um, you know, you see that a lot with, with mental health type situations where there's a, someone will get into a situation and it just exacerbates whatever they might have, you know, this like underlying. And then the next thing, you know, they're full blown, you know, either depression or anxiety or, or psychosis or whatever. Sometimes it's associated with substance abuse. Sometimes it's not but there's, it's like a trigger and I could definitely see where, you know, putting myself in, in his shoes, like, okay, if I'm going to be in prison for 95 years, like I'm going to, I'm going to lose it. Okay. And I can definitely see where he kind of went down that path for sure. Um, Cause you're hopeless at that point. So yeah, all you can do is yeah. better your immediate circumstances, which may mean lying to get into the Marion County jail. Yep. You know? I mean, obviously we're not saying there's no way Forrester did it. We don't know who did it, but you know, we, we think Forrester gets mentioned or, you know, gets uh, touted a little bit too much. And he got, a, he did get a lot of press. He got a lot of press. His picture was in the paper. And, and I think to some extent, that's what he wanted um, to draw attention to himself. And then I, you know, I think maybe it, it, it negatively affected, you know, I, I know Jim Kramer was, was, uh, was quoted as, you know, People think, hey, they might think Don Forrester did this. And then, you know, someone that knows something doesn't have a reason to come forward and say, oh, I saw this or I, you know, I heard this or whatever. Um, and that's kind of one of those things that it's kind of. It, it's kind of a double edged sword, I think, with with a, a deal like Forrester, because it does get a lot of publicity for the case. And I mean, it, at that point, it had only been eight years after the fact, but it still got a lot of publicity. It got it back in people's in front of people's eyes. But then it kind of led them to the conclusion like, oh, well, he did it. He confessed, you know, so it, yeah. it was good. It was, I think I can see where it was a good thing and a bad thing. Wanted to bounce over to the robbery gang. This theory posits that the murders were committed by a robbery gang that had been targeting Indianapolis area burger chefs. According to the hypothesis, something went wrong for the robbers at the Speedway Burger Chef, 
which resulted in the murders being committed. We covered this theory in the episode, The Robbers. The robbery gang is one that, you know, has been very, also very uh, popularized uh, in the press, uh, given uh, Burger Chef lead investigator Stoney Van of the ISP um, sort of talked about why that hit was his number one theory. But what, uh, what do you think of robbery gang and sort of where does that stand for you in this whole crazy mess? <laughs> I think it's possible. Why even take them away from the restaurant? The victims in this case, of course, were kidnapped from the restaurant in Speedway and taken to a rural area on the south side owned by the Hager family. One of the arguments for the robbery gang theory is that some of the members were from the south side and so would have been presumably familiar with the area where the murders occurred. Um, if you're recognized, why not just do it there? And then, you know, we go back to the whole point of, well, they knew this, they were from Johnson County. They knew this area. Well, um, I know, I think a couple of the guys were from the Greenwood area, but they, they were over more towards, you know, the county line and 31, you know, that neck of the woods. Um, then, you know, a few of the guys were from, I think, the, you know, Franklin. And it, it's a pretty good haul from, from where the Heger's property was to, you know, either of those locales. I mean, I, I could just see there being a lot more convenient places that were even more secluded than where the Heger's lived to if, if they were going to take everybody away from from the restaurant um to do what they did and you know i go back to if they knew that area really well i don't see why they would have chosen it because the proximity of of homes even at that time uh you know we hear all the time in the in the, in the, the newspaper accounts oh it was a rural isolated spot and everything there was houses within 300 feet about of, of where where this the whole, at least where the shooting happened, I think. Now, not, I mean, not having any, you know, knowledge of any official sketches or anything like that, just from what I've been able to put together from my own research, looking at aerial photographs and the old news clips, you know, where all the police cars were parked and where the, the officers are seen walking up out of the, out of the weeds. Um, you know, I think there were, there was home probably within 300 feet. And then the owner of the property, which, which would have been Fred and Rosemary Heger would, been probably 500 feet at most at the end of that driveway. So I just don't see somebody that really knew that area choosing to go to that particular spot if that's what they knew they were going to do when they got there. Do you have a preferred theory about what happened? I don't. I At this point, I lean more towards it being something that was somehow drug related and I think that some of the people that were involved may have even been, you know, high on drugs at the time or um, just unpredictable. And I also kind of something about me, something about this tells me that maybe it was a younger, a younger group, or at least some components of the group were younger and maybe weren't really prepared to, to do what they did. And I don't even, and then this is just me thinking about it, but I don't know that even murder was on the table initially. If we look at what happened once they got to the scene, you know, most of your revolvers, we've never heard from anybody that has any inside knowledge on the case. Um, if there was more than one gun, you know, we've never heard, we've just heard 38. We've never heard if it was both Danny and Ruth were shot with the same gun, or if one was shot with one gun, one was shot with the other. I tend to think there was only one gun there because it seems like they ran out of ammo. This is not a pleasant thing to think about, but I know Teresa said in, in, at one point that Ruth was not shot three times. She was shot twice, I think she said. So let's just assume Danny's shot three times, Ruth shot twice. If it's a five round revolver, we now have an empty gun. And, and like I said, this is not a, it's not a pleasant thing to think about. It's not fun, but you, you have to put yourself there and, and really go over it in your head. So they run out of ammo, then what? They still have two other victims. Mark, to me, is, a, is the biggest question. It would be helpful to know, at least from you know, my personal edification, exactly where he was. Was he, did he run to the east? Did he run to the west? Where Jane ended up? And I think the issue with Jane being stabbed was panic on the part of whoever did it. Oh my gosh, these people are getting away. 
and we have now we have no other choice. We've just killed their two friends. Now we've got to get rid of everybody. And I think that's why she was stabbed like that. And I also think the knife is a really interesting piece to this. And I, I'd like to see, I know, I know they released this, that the picture of the knife that we all saw, but I'd really, I, I think it would be very interesting to see, you know, if there's ever been any meta, metallurgical testing done, uh, do they have any idea what kind of knife it was? Was it a commercial um, commercially made knife. You know, I've heard speculation on another podcast that somebody made this themselves and that's entirely possible. And it's also possible that it was a commercially made knife that just w- was abused a lot, but I own a hunting knife that is kind of similar in size. And, and sh- at least from what I get from the picture is similar in size and, you know, probably thickness and, and metal gauge. And I just don't see how it could fail like that even with how it was used, it's that to me is just very, very strange. Yeah. And yeah, I I really, I don't have, I don't have a pet theory because I try to, I try to keep my mind open to everything because there's just so much out there. And, you know, even as somebody that's not working on this in an official aspect, it's, it's a, it's a point of interest for me. And I, I just look at it, you know, in my own time and just, it's a good mental exercise for, for, for me, but it, it's, there's just so many questions and so many possibilities. And I, and it, I don't think it's smart to, unless you have some real good evidence, I don't think it's smart to lock yourself down to any one thing. So that's kind of where I'm at with it. Yeah. And I really like what you did just now, which is kind of like break down the crime itself rather than saying like, here's the people who must've done it. Like, it's more of like, how could this have played out and why would it have played out like that? Like, uh, uh, and, it, and it's it's not a pleasant thing to think about. And it's why I I I, I mentioned it. I I kind of posted my thoughts about it one time on one of the groups, and and I got I was kind of upset. I felt like I may have upset Teresa a little bit by discussing it, but she was like, "No, you know, it's fine. You know, it's one of those things that needs to be out there." But you know, I'm I'm kind of glad that that particular thread I don't think exists anymore. But it's it's just one of those things that that has to be something you got to think about because it can I think point towards a certain type of person that may have may have done it. Um, it can point towards okay, it was a, a kid that was you know high on meth or or you know somebody that was using you know whatever party drugs were the big thing. I mean, cocaine was a big you know huge thing back then. Um, and don't see it so much anymore, but that, that was a, a big deal back in that, in that time period. And it's just, it can, I think it can point towards that and just the fact of how they ended up getting to where they were at, even to begin with, to that particular spot was like, what was the mental process that went through? And I think it was, a, I think it was, I think there was a big lack of preparation on, on the part of, of whoever did this. And I don't, I, I just, something about it tells me they weren't ready to do what they did. And then it happened. Yeah. A lot of the crime scene speaks to some kind of panic or lack of preparation, not, not the kind of calculation you might expect given that it's gone unsolved for all these years, which makes it even more frustrating because, right. you know, it's just, they got lucky. The bad guys got extremely, extremely lucky. And I think that that's why also just, you know, for the, the research you do is important because you're actually, you know, there's a lot of easy assumptions you could make just hearing the press reports and the initial kind of discussion where Mark was beaten to death, right? Okay, well, is that someone's angry at Mark? And then you find that actually he just kind of sustained one injury that seemed to knock him out and cause his death. You know, you mentioned the uh, uh, you know, the knife, you know, you think, oh, somebody was just so angry with Jane that he, it, it stabbed and broke off inside her. And you're pointing out that shouldn't happen with a normal knife. So what was going on there? Like, there's all these little details um, in, in the location, especially uh, where, you know, having those public documents or having that knowledge base or having a greater understanding of, of the crime scene actually paints a totally different picture than what you might expect just reading about it yeah Um, absolutely 
Uh, yeah, I guess we kind of went through some of the big theories and kind of generally some, maybe the weakness of being only theory based and, and less, you know, evidence based. I think I think we should I think in any case, we should all try to be evidence based as as much as it is tempting to be like it was these guys. Yeah. Um, my, um, my my boss tells me all the time, find the truth. Don't find the bad guy. Find the truth. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, then there's a lot of bad guys. I mean, if, if anything is a lesson from Burger Chefs, there's a lot of bad guys out there, but there's not a lot of murderers necessarily. Right. And, and it can be a little bit, if people are violent and people are doing bad things, it can be a little bit tempting to be like, ah, it must be just this guy because we want to have an answer on that. But mm -hmm. it, that, that's, uh, yeah, but that way lies madness, <laughs> right? As we found. Um, yes. Uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, if, other than the obvious question, who killed these four young people, you know, what are some big questions that you have about the case that you'd like answered uh, that you feel like might further all of our understanding of what happened? That's a tough one. Wow. I mean, you, you could you could go so many places with that, you know, was what about the negative heel shoes? OK. These were a pair of shoes found on a bridge not far from the restaurant on the day after the murders. They were said to resemble a pair of shoes owned by victim Jane Freet. Were they Janes? Were they Ruths? Who were they? I mean, who did they belong to? And, and I know we, we talked about, you know, evidence in, in that time not being collected with DNA in mind because it really wasn't, a they, they weren't aware of it and, and the great potential that it has now in 2021 you know, he didn't have that 78, but would that be something that could, could be looked at now? Um, you know, as far as the car, uh, I've heard rumors that, that ISP still has Jane's car. I don't think that's true. Um, there would have been no reason for them to keep it beyond processing it. So, you know, we could easily look back and say now, well, yeah, they should have kept it because they could have got, you know, touch DNA off the inside. But again, in 1978, and I think Todd McComas made a great point on this, you know, back then it would, it would, it made sense to steal an employee's car and use it to get to your getaway car because touch DNA wasn't something that they were looking at. You know, they, they weren't, they weren't processing vehicles look in, in looking for that. So as long as they didn't leave prints, they're good. So I, you know, I don't think that is super important because they probably still don't have it, I'm sure. Um, but to the car, you know, when you when you go back and think about the car, OK, we think about the palm print that um, <clears throat> was left on the car. A palm print was indeed discovered on Jane's car after the vehicle was found abandoned near a park that was a little over a mile from the Speedway Burger Chef. And I would like to know if any work was done as far as maybe determining a time frame when that could have been left. I posted a thread on this a while, and it was more of an academic exercise for me because I didn't know a lot about latent prints and how well they're going to stand up to various weather conditions and what surface they're on, all that kind of stuff. And I, I learned that there's actually quite a few variables, you know, is the print made with just, you know, the, the sebum, the normal stuff from your skin, or is it, you know, grease or vegetable oil or animal fat or whatever. And then how is that going to stand up in various weather conditions? Like I went so far as looking at what the weather forecast, you know, what the, what the recorded weather was in Indianapolis around that time. And I learned that it rained a lot. So then that begs the question, okay, where was the car parked? What was this stuff? You know, what were these prints made out of? Um, was any work done on that? And it would just be interesting to find out how long is a print on a, on a painted surface like a car hold up under, under a circumstance like that? Because that could, you know, maybe be used to either, you know, hone in on, okay, was this print left on the 17th, the night of the 17th, or was it maybe, could it have been several days before that? You know, did Jane have a carport at her apartment? Just the little, little small minute details like that, that I think are, are things that would, and, and some of the stuff may have been answered and some of the stuff may, may be in the files from back then that, you know, we don't know about just from the outside looking in, but it, it would be interesting to know some little tiny things like that that might not seem huge, but, you know, they could point you in, in, a, in a direction.
Right. And yeah, it's sometimes those little things that totally recalibrate our understanding of the case, as you said, in a case where motive and why this happened isn't entirely clear, uh, or at least why it happened the way it happened, why there was kidnapping rather than killing in the restaurant, why uh, different modes of killing. I wanted to ask you one more question, if that's okay. Um, you're an amazing researcher. Uh, what are your tips? What are your tips for people who want to be good researchers when it comes to a crime like this, you know, either Burger Chef or one like it, you know, do you have any advice? The most important thing is, is don't, is keep your mind open. Don't, um, don't get tunnel vision and understand that, you know, what resources are out there. You can learn so much from old newspapers, public records, uh, records that you might not even think are relevant. You know, one of the things we discussed was water well records in determining when a property was built, you know, stuff like that, that, that is just public information. You don't need any sort of, you know, legal process or anything to go out and get it. You can just, it, it's there. You just got to know where to look for it. And it, it is just amazing to me sometimes is how those little bits and pieces can connect um, when you're trying to build a, a bigger picture of, of something, you know, what happened. We'd like to thank Hank for taking the time to talk with us. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Murder Sheet. As always, thanks to Kevin Tyler Greenlee, who composed the music for The Murder Sheet, and who you can find on the web at kevintg.com. To keep up with the latest on The Murder Sheet, please make sure to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Murder Sheet and on Facebook at M Sheet Podcast, or by searching Murder Sheet. If you enjoy listening to The Murder Sheet, please leave us a five-star review to help us gain more exposure. And send tips, suggestions, and feedback to murdersheet at gmail.com. Thanks so much for listening.